we talk about your new narrowed full year EPS forecast. How much of that reflects a changing appetite among the consumer base versus uh, pricing power that you have in this uh, current economy? Yes, yeah, so our, our updated forecast really was um, tightening the range as we near the end of our year, making sure that we give investors a better view of how our year is shaping up. I mean, that's what the adjusting of the range was. You know, but as we think about our portfolio, we've got a great balance of iconic brands that we've had in our portfolio forever. And it really complements some of the newer additions to our brand. When we think about Applegate, the leader in natural and organic space, Justin's, a leader in almond nut butters, and then some of the innovative work that we've done. One of the hot topics today in our investor day was our foray into plant-based proteins with happy little plants. Hmm. Yeah, very on trend considering the rocket ship that has been beyond meat in terms of its performance since its IPO, Impossible Foods. Do you think that this is something that's going to stick, that's going to be here to stay in terms of plant-based technology and, and indeed a move away from meat? Because your bet on Applegate was about getting better quality meat, but how much do you think that we might see some sort of eating into that market share with, with non-meat meat? Well, I mean, I, I think the important thing to remember is, I mean, plant-based protein isn't a new concept, right? I mean, we've had plant-based burgers and patties in the marketplace for, uh, for a long time. I think that consumers maybe have a renewed energy, and we like to say they're a little more plant curious than they've been in the past. And so the consumer that we've identified is still a meat eater. They're just looking for ways to introduce plants into their diet a little more frequently. And so, you know, the, one of our mantras is we're going to meet the consumer where they want to go. And Happy Little Plants and some of our other plant-based initiatives in our food service business really puts us squarely in that space. What has surprised you the most, Jim, about uh, the different eating trends that are out there? Caroline mentioned plant-based foods, um, as well as a, a focus less on meats as people move away, perhaps just from meat-based diets entirely. What's taken you by surprise, in a, in a good or bad way? Yeah, I don't know if I would say surprise. I mean, we obviously have a, a great insights team that continues to keep us on top of what's happening. You know, we're really focused on some of our ethnic foods initiatives. We have an incredible portfolio of Mexican food products. And when you think about what's happening demographically in this country, I mean, again, we're front and center with that Hispanic consumer. Um, yeah. We talk about the move into natural and organic meats and our, our acquisition of Applegate put us in that space. And so, you know, I, I don't know if consumers truly are eating less meat. I think they're going to continue to look for just different options over time. Natural and organic. Now, square this with perhaps one of your iconic brands, and depends where in the world you are, as to perhaps your taste for it. We've got to talk spam and the innovation that's going on there and the reception that you see to spam. I mean, I'm interested in particular that this is something that there's a penchant for in China. And is this that something that you're seeing being affected in any way through trade dilemmas and geopolitical tensions? Yeah, so we're not as impacted by some of the trade issues. I mean, we don't export or import to or from China. You know, as you think about, though, your, your original comment around natural and organic and squaring it with our portfolio, I mean, it's perfectly squared when you know that we're focused on the consumer. And so making sure that our product aligns with the consumer need state. And so whether we build it or buy it, we're going to find ways to meet the consumer where they, where they want to be. Um, and, and speaking of spam, and I know that you guys have a spam plant in China, uh, which allows you not to have to import uh, spam. There have been problems with the pork supply in that country because of swine flu. Have you seen that affect demand for spam? Has there, has there been an uptick in demand for spam, for instance, as a result? Yeah, so we started producing spam in China just two short years ago, and the acceptance has been incredible. You know, the Chinese consumer already had what we call a, a canned meat mentality, but then being able to introduce an iconic American brand that's well known in a lot of parts of Asia, it's made the introduction really exceed our expectations. And so we've been really pleased and expect it to continue to grow for a really long time. And lastly, I've got to ask you, pumpkin spice spam. Jim, who's eating it? Everyone, apparently. <laughs> uh, 
you know, it, it's so funny, the craze that this has become. When we announced that we were going to do it in mid-August to when we actually started selling it at the end of September, we've had over 1.1 billion media impressions. So it's really garnering a lot of attention. Uh, you know, we sold out of the limited production that we had in seven hours. Uh, in, a, in the spirit of full transparency, it actually crashed our website. And so <laughs> consumers were dying to get their hands on it. Now some of it's being resold online for $25 a can.